It has been a privilege and a challenge to have to choose among all the qualified projects from so many places in the world. The result is that many more projects had to be involved, included in this volume, so it is much bigger than the first one. All in all, 263 pages compared with 158 in the last one. We have limited, uh, limited us to four to five projects under each of the goals. And it has really been a hard work. The architecture guide is available on the websites and in a limited number in a printed version. The intention is to make it freely available for students, professionals, politicians, polit and researchers, and everybody else. The idea is that it should be very widely used, and we know that translations will be available in Chinese, Arabic, Brazil, Brazilian, slash Portuguese. And as from today, we will start an Instagram profile to show the fantastic pictures from the projects and to help spreading the news about how architecture interacts with all the goals. We hope that we can make a physical launch in Rio next summer in connection with the UA World Congress, which was postponed from this summer, but it will hopefully be um, implemented next year. And then we will, we are planning to make an exhibition with some of the examples from the guidebook and the Brazilian examples. It is very comforting and encouraging to see that so many great projects are realized all around the world. And today we will hear in more detail about some of them. We have invited wonderful speakers to join us today. First, we have a greeting from the former Danish Minister of Finance, Mons Lykketoft. Then our chief editor, Natalie Moussi, will present our views um, on the interaction between architecture and the SDGs. Then we will hear more about the Star Homes project in Tanzania by Jakob Knudsen. And then, about the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture in Rwanda by Kelly Doran. This will be followed by a debate moderated by Natalie Moussi about the role of architecture with three distinguished speakers, namely Istiak Sahirte Titas from Bangladesh, Isauro Torres from Chile, and Ramatu Aliu from Nigeria. And I'll do my best to finish the webinar at half past two. If you have any questions, please use the chat box to the right. We will read the questions and put as many as possible to the speakers. So with all this said, I would like to hand over to the first speaker who will be with us on video. Mr. Mons Lukatov, the former Danish Minister of Finance and Foreign Affairs, and also former president of the United Nations General Assembly at exactly the time when the SDGs were adopted by the UN. So you will not have the chance to put direct questions to Mr. Lukatov, but questions could be written. So please put on the video greeting from Bones. Thank you. The Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement were big steps forward for the United Nations. There have been setbacks since then, but still the Sustainable Development Goals are the necessary agenda. We need to understand, yes, we must fight poverty, but no, we cannot do it in a traditional economic model. We must break the vicious circle of increasing and monumental inequality in this world. We must realize that profound transformation to sustainable patterns for produ production and consumption are necessary now. The globe is simply too small for a population three times as big as, as when I was born and 10 times impacting more the resources we have, the atmosphere around us. Climate is the most urgent of the goals if we should avoid the damage and conflict that will take away energy and resources from solving all the other goals. Therefore, it's hands, all hands on deck. It's encouraging that big cities 
big companies and civil society all are very active in the fight for sustainable development. Governments have to do much more, also to educate and mobilize around the world. Special responsibility is there for those of us who have uh, the ability and obligation to, to design the sustainable future, the sustainable society. That goes for politicians and political scientists, for economists, engineers, and architects. It's good to know that these architects go big and are in the forefront of all of this. Thank you very much to Mons Lukatoft. He was very sorry that he couldn't join us in person. So we are very happy that you could make this video uh, talk to us. And now with this, I will give the word to Mrs. Natalia Musin, who is the chief editor of this guidebook. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Natalia Musin is also the co-chair of the UAS SDG Commission member of the UAA Region 1, president of the UAA 2023 20, Congress from Copenhagen, and also head of the Architecture and Technology Institute at the Royal Danish Academy of Architecture. So over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's such a pleasure to be here today and be able to celebrate all the work being done all over the world by uh, so many uh, architects. I'll, um, I'll share my screen. Oops. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, I'm not. Uh, are you getting the image? Yes, it. I will try again. Um, you see the. Okay. Yeah, it seems uh, it might be. I'll, I'll give it one more try. Uh, prefer, I have beautiful slides to show you. I would prefer to be able to share them. Uh, let me give it a one more go. Just a second. Oh, it, uh, let's see. It seems somebody else is sharing the screen. Let's try again. Now, yeah. Do you get the, the slides? We get the picture. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to be able to show you also the beautiful um, images of, um, of the project. Uh, basically, um, well, what I'm uh, here to talk about uh, before we get to the two uh, in depth case presentation is the overall interaction between architecture and the goals, and the fact that architecture truly has a contribution uh, to all the goals. As uh, Mr. Lugatov was uh, addressing this uh, UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals, represents the aspiration of the people of the United Nations for a more sustainable future. They define a set of serious challenges that we must address together to make a uh, 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 to make the world livable, both in a humane and in an environmental sense. Architects and the built environment are part of the current problems, but also vital to the solutions we need in order to accomplish the goals. Uh, in this uh, small book, we have brought together more than 80 built projects that illustrate that architecture is already contributing, can contribute, and certainly does interact with each and every one of the goals. The project uh, in the in the book span the globe, and as Annette uh, uh, Cleaver addressed in the beginning, there were so many more we would have liked to, uh, to show, but we have tried to uh, uh, represent different scales, different local contexts, and different parts uh, of uh, of the challenges, different ways of addressing solutions and contributing uh, to the goals. The many many good projects are not the uh, and here you see an overview of all uh, the cases included in the book. All those many good projects are not uh, the final word or the final solution to these, uh, the big and pressing uh, questions, 
but they each represent an actual, a real contribution that has an impact for real people and for the environment. Our hope is that through a discussion uh, based on the goals, based on the real examples of architecture that, that contributes, we can move forward to the next steps, find the next solutions, uh, the additional solutions uh, that we need to find in each and every project. Um, I will try to very briefly run through the 17 goals because they're also self-mentioning. I will uh, bring forward uh, a project per goal uh, and briefly address the challenge that this project is interacting with. This will not do the project themselves full, uh, uh, full service. It will not explain them enough. So I hope that you will go to the book which you can download for free to hear more about the actual architecture, the actual project and the contributors, because this is sort of a, a very, very quick uh, flyover. And then uh, we will move to two in-depth cases and you will get more detail there. Because of course, in the end, what matters is then the real details, the real solutions, the actual build project and how it was done. But I'll attempt this quick, uh, quick flyover. Uh, the first of the 17 sustainable development goals is no poverty. And I think certainly that is the first goal for a reason. It's a massive uh, challenge for the world today. Uh, and it, it spills over on all the rest of the goals. Architecture itself cannot lift people out of poverty, but the built environment affect, can affect the impact of poverty on people's lives. And we can uh, alleviate that by providing access to affordable housing, sanitation, educational institutions, and other key facilities. And the project I'll just show very briefly here is Empower Shack Housing uh, from Cape Town, South Africa, where a broad and uh, dedicated team has provided a real impact uh, for the people living in this neighborhood, but also a template uh, of how to scale it up through a free uh, digital tool on, uh, on the planning solutions um, involved. The second goal uh, among the 17 is zero hunger. We have to rethink how we grow, share, and consume our food. And the build, in the built environment, we must contribute uh, to secure the securing of food supplies through planning, landscape, and building designs that protect existing ecosystems and prioritize the preservation and expansion of areas for food production. We will get back to this goal when uh, Kelly uh, Doran uh, gives us this presentation later. But uh, here I'm showing uh, an example of micro gardening in the refugee camps of Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. This is also an excellent example of the fact that architecture can contribute regardless of the budget, uh, of the space available, and other things that we, that we tend to think are necessary to make a contribution. We would point to budget, we would point plot size and other limitations and say, well, what can we do here? But in this refugee camp, a number of uh, NGOs have managed uh, to create micro gardens on barren land very little, with very little space up against each dwelling and a major impact uh, because residents both get a chance to themselves uh, grow food. They supplement a diet on the dried, uh, uh, dried uh, foods that are supplied by NGOs and they can also uh, shape the tents and uh, uh, um, create a better indoor climate with the plants growing up onto the roofs of, uh, of these temporary dwellings. It's a micro scale, it's a major impact uh, at a low budget. Uh, the goal number three is good health and well being. And I think uh, if we didn't know before, all architects and everybody else, all the professions have realized that it's true this year that certainly spatial organization and the conditions uh, of how we organize ourselves in the built environment has a major impact on health both on the spread of diseases, but also on, the, on many other aspects of, uh, of our, uh, our health, such as uh, respiratory diseases uh, and so on. Um, Mr. Jakob Knudsen will uh, present the Star Home project in Tanzania in more depth uh, later today. Uh, it's a project where um, uh, doctors and architects are working together create, to create uh, models for affordable housing with a, a huge positive impact on health and the limitation on the spreading of diseases. 
The goal number four out of the 17 is quality education. And simply put, schools and educational spaces are a crucial part of our investment in the future, and especially to make uh, education available uh, to young people, to students who might otherwise not get uh, a quality education. Uh, the project I'm just briefly showing uh, here is a Danish project, the South Harbor School, and it, it, uh, it's a project in an urban development area, a old industrial area, where it's creating quality education, but also creating uh, communal spaces where people can meet after hours uh, is key in creating a healthy new neighborhood uh, in the city. And then number five, gender equality. To support a movement towards gender equality, the design of building settlement and urban areas must be inclusive to all citizens regardless of gender. As the UN points out, we have major issues regarding women's health, regarding <coughs> women's access to the workplace uh, and of course there are also uh, issues that uh, address uh, issues regarding how we include a broader uh, group of gender identity in the built environment. The project I'm briefly showing here is the Women's Opportunity Center in Rwanda. Uh, as many of you will know, uh, Rwanda was profoundly affected uh, by war and, uh, and was left uh, after the war with a population uh, with a majority of females in some areas up to 80%. That uh, kick-started a necessary movement to more, towards uh, gender, gender inclusivity. And uh, as part of that, it has been important to empower and support women in learning uh, um, traits, learning um, uh, how to support themselves, how to support their family, and this beautiful project uh, is a community driven project that does just that. Moving on to goal number six, clean water and sanitation. Again, simply put, adequate treatment and disposal of sewage, access to clean drinking water, and access to hand washing and steaming are essential to human health and to stopping the spread of bacteria and viruses. This is a huge, uh, uh, an area of huge concern many places in the world, and we certainly need to develop new solutions to address it. This beautiful project from Vietnam addressed a problem that uh, in this country, many uh, schools uh, have no uh, toilets or uh, at all, or also adequate toilets. This project is a, a provide students and staff with uh, basic sanitation, but it also, uh, address uh, and help uh, the environmental uh, conditions as sewage and solid waste. The built environment is a major source of energy consumption and it's throughout the life cycle of building and structures from the extraction of raw materials and production of components or the construction of buildings and structures to the energy consumed throughout the building of structures lifetime. And of course, the energy used in this assembly and disposal of reuse. Too often we are focused solely on uh, energy uh, during the sort of energy for use of the building, but we have to look at the whole range. And the project I'm showing here um, from Burkina Faso is a beautiful project that addresses exactly that whole range. It sources materials locally, they are low impact, not a lot of transportation, local skills uh, used in uh, building, uh, and a lot of natural. Uh, uh, natural light, natural ventilation employed in the design of the building. For goal number 11, uh, decent work and economic growth, Mr. Lukasov also addressed that uh, in his introduction. We have to look at how we create uh, decent economic conditions while at the same time respecting the planet, planet's boundaries. The built environment is tagged with decent work and economic growth on both a planning level and a building level. We need safe public spaces and affordable transit routes to the work, workplace so that people can find employment. And in the industry itself, focus is needed on decent, decent working conditions and safety for workers. The project I'm showing here is from Uganda. It's a Mount Sinai ambulatory. It addresses the problem that uh, when you are in the countryside, it's difficult for surgeons to find professional peers 
that can help uh, with training and exploration in order to maintain and develop skills. In this project, uh, there's a beautiful combination of the local and the global. Um, this facility is local, it serves a local community, it is there on site with high level staff, but it is linked to Mount Sinai in, uh, in New York, uh, in the States, and and the uh, sessions of training are done during also search, uh, surgery through uh, a digital connection between surgeons. So you can have a peer environment that crosses the globe. You can have training uh, um, of skills at, at the highest uh, global level, but you can also be local. You can be present in a local uh, condition where your help is needed. And moving on to goal number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure. The building industry is producing massive amounts of waste and consuming large amounts of natural resource and energy. Further to this, transportation of production of building components globally rather than locally carry environmental as well as humane costs. And for this project, I'll not say a lot because we'll get back to you, Kelly, later. But it's a beautiful example of a school done uh, almost entirely with local materials and local um, uh, craftsmen, lo local uh, skills, but also uh, used, the project was used as an occasion to build up skills in a local context that can then be employed on other buildings so that we get, again, a bigger effect, a scale-up effect, and, uh, and uh, it ripples on from the first buildings to more buildings. Reduced inequalities in, in many ways, one of the most difficult and challenging goals addressing us. It's a big, big challenge uh, globally uh, that we have rising inequalities and we must address it uh, everywhere we can and in all our projects. Uh, at its worst, the built environment can act as an amplifier and enforcer of inequalities, but to reduce inequalities, planning and building must prioritize design that ensures inclusion and accessibility for all including uh, citizens that are marginalized at risk of living with disability. And here we see uh, a project in Myanmar, the farming kindergarten. It's a project that enables women to uh, uh, take a job, to uh, create a career, because the workplace is uh, providing professional uh, childcare for their children while they're at work. Um, and again, the project warrants much more uh, discussion, but I'll I'll move forward to, to uh, be able to pass on uh, the word in time. The goal number 11, the sustainable cities and communities. This is a big goal for architecture. The built environment is crucial to the development of, city, of sustainable cities and communities. And certainly in multiple ways, we can contrib contribute to make cities and settlements inclusive, safe, healthy, resilient, and environmentally sustainable. The project here is a residence and cultural center in Senegal where a diverse population is brought together uh, by this uh, shared uh, communal space where uh, both uh, artistic and, uh, and other uh, uh, activities are taking place and uh, ensuring that uh, civic space uh, is available and can support the surrounding community. For goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. Well, Again, the building industry is a major consumer of natural resources and they contribute to waste. We have to design for long lifetime, steady maintenance, and we have to keep what we already have, carefully adapting existing buildings. All those strategies are keys to sustainable consumption in the building environment. And of course, when we build, again, when we build new, we have to think about what we put into those buildings and how it might be able to live on from the first use. The project here is from Spain, live reusing for Cecilia. And it's a beautiful strategy, a combination of uh, reuse of, uh, of old components, reuse from uh, uh, buildings that have fallen into uh, disuse, uh, and then combined with local uh, low impact uh, organic materials. And I will move on, uh, trying to be quick here, to uh, uh, climate uh, action. We must reduce our CO2 footprint and adapt also to climate, the climate change that's already taking place. The project here is one of the uh, big uh, sponge city initiatives in China, a uh, big movement with uh, 30 cities now designated as, uh, as sponge cities. 
and I'll uh, I'll again I'll let you a lot of detail and I hope you'll find that uh, in the book. Reduce inequality. Oh, sorry. Uh, life below water. Well, most of the building built environment is situated on land, but building settlements and infrastructure, as well as the production and construction of those structures, affects the ocean. It's when we transport things across the ocean. When it's when what we build meets the sea, and certainly that happens a lot of the time. Uh, this example from Sydney, Australia, addresses the fact that many cities, uh, when uh, when we build up towards the ocean, we do so with smooth surfaces where there's no possibility of uh, of uh, the ocean life uh, continuing. This can be addressed, uh, and uh, and this project uh, creates a simple uh, modular system that can help create uh, living uh, living spaces for both plants and animals underwater. And we move then to number 15, life on land. Well, the amount of those structures, building and settlements, the cities we, uh, we live in, they, they're taking up land and the amount of land we have taken in is growing. Um, we have to address that in a number of ways, both respecting the, that virgin land that we have, but also reclaiming land and, and creating uh, corridors for life uh, wildlife and uh, plants also in, in the built uh, structures in cities. This project um, from uh, Switzerland is a re renovation uh, project where uh, nature is coming back to a heavily industrialized farming area where uh, rivers have been streamlined uh, in an earlier phase of industrialization, uh, killing off uh, biodiversity and where that biodiversity is now hopefully coming back. Uh, through a uh, ambitious project that uh, allows again uh, for a different uh, level of cohabitation between the uh, farming and uh, natural ecosystems. For peace, justice, and strong institutions, we are now at the very uh, the last two goals. We have to remember that parliaments, courthouses, and civic institutions like public libraries are cornerstones in a just and peaceful society. While uh, spaces like local community centers, place for worship and memorials can represent citizens' commitment to social change and to an inclusive and compassionate society. What we show here is a national memorial for peace and justice in Montgomery, uh, in the States. It addresses uh, the hurtful history of lynching in the States and for the first time, uh, ensure that there's a collective memorial for, uh, for what happened. Using architecture, using the memorial as an active tool uh, in a contemporary need to understand and address uh, the continued inequality and the long traces of, uh, of what happened then. And finally, goal number 17, partnerships for the goals. Certainly uh, these goals were, uh, it's the, it's the nation state that adopted them in the UN, but the nation states cannot achieve these measures uh, on their own. It's for all of us. We need all profession, we need all actors, we need citizens, we need everybody uh, if we are to achieve the, um, what the promise of the goals to reach a higher level of humane and environmental sustainability. And every home building and settlement from the very tiny, like the micro gardens in Bangladesh, so the biggest uh, corporate development can contribute at some level, can do something to help address the big challenges uh, ahead of us. So uh, no single stakeholder, no architect, of course, either can reach the goals alone, but together we can make an impact, we can make a difference. And I think the two projects we'll see now will help uh, illustrate that uh, further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, you almost made it. At the, at the time. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm impressed about this very quick introduction to all the 17 sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. So now we go on to see some of the projects. Uh, and first of all, I would like to invite our next presenter, Mr. Jakob Knudsen, who is the Dean at the Royal Danish Academy of Architecture. But before that, Mr. Knudsen was owner of Ingvartsen's Practicing Architects, and he will inform us and tell us a little bit about the Star Homes project in Tanzania. So over to you, Jakob. Thank you.
Is it on? Can you see me and yes. hear me? Yeah. 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 Thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm happy to uh, to uh, to tell you a bit about our, our project in uh, Tanzania about the the Star Homes. Uh, this is a, a picture from the, the building site, but I'm going to take you a tour on other projects that have uh, led to this uh, this uh, experiment where we are trying to build healthy uh, homes in uh, the southern uh, uh, part of Tanzania. Uh, when most people talk about health, we think about uh, uh, vaccines or medicine or hospitals, but, uh, but actually that's only part of it. A, a huge contribution to health is uh, coming from uh, uh, from the houses, from the homes. If you look at a, t a country like Tanzania, uh, three out of the four top causes uh, of uh, death uh, are linked to uh, directly to the building, to the houses. Respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, and malaria. These are all kind of major uh, diseases associated uh, with uh, with the building, and it's uh, killing not least uh, children uh, in uh, in great numbers. It's, uh, it's not a new thing. It has always been like this. Uh, 500 meters from where I'm sitting here in Copenhagen, we have these beautiful row houses called the potato rows. Today, they are some of the most expensive houses in, in the city of Copenhagen. But actually, when they were built, it was, it was a health intervention. It was because there was uh, lots of diseases in the city of Copenhagen, as, as in all the cities of Europe. Uh, and this was uh, an attempt to, uh, to make people live a, a, a healthier uh, life. So it's not a new idea to use architecture as a health intervention, but it has been kind of forgotten. But if you think about it overall, it's probably half of the uh, half of the uh, the growth in mean age is probably related to architecture and engineering, not to hospitals and uh, medicine. So we have a we have a lot to do as uh, architects here. Some years ago, I was asked uh, by the University of Copenhagen to do a laboratory in Tanzania, a research uh, laboratory. Uh, um, this was a place where they wanted to uh, uh, to make a, a malaria vaccine, and uh, they needed a, a laboratory to to uh, to look at this. So there's 228 million cases of malaria last year in the world, and there's 400,000 people dying from uh, malaria last year. It's expected to be much higher this year due to COVID. It could even double uh, due to COVID this year because of uh, the, the problems. Uh, but but uh, but still, it's it's a major it's a major problem in the uh, in the uh, in the south. Uh, we tried to do this a laboratory, which was a sustainable building. It was built to uh, to with uh, systems for passive cooling, uh, natural ventilation, and and uh, trying to make a, a very strong and uh, and comfortable building in a in a very rural area of Tanzania, only using local materials and local uh, labor force. Uh, in, inside, it was a modern laboratory because they were running all these uh, tests uh, or these uh, vaccine trials. Um, but it was uh, it was made uh, by uh, only using local resources. During the process, I I started to talk a lot with uh, a medical doctor who was uh, running this uh, trial, and we started to discuss the relation between architecture and malaria uh, and bed nets, not least. So the malaria is trans transmitted by a mosquito. And so people use bed nets uh, to prevent this, and this is very efficient. But the problem is that people are living in in, in houses uh, that are that are quite uh, unventilated, so it becomes very hot if you add a, a bed net. Uh, actually, you know that um, it, a lot of studies has shown that uh, the reason for people not using the bed net is that it becomes very hot inside a house if you add an extra net. So, so we wanted to. To, to discuss this and <clears throat> we uh, we came up this uh, medical doctor and I with a with a project where we said let's uh, let's try to understand this uh, issues about bed nets so people don't end up using the bed net for fishing uh, like it's done here not because people are ignorant but, but because it's uh, probably too uncomfortable uh, to use the net and they, they use it for something reasonable we looked at four countries we looked at Tanzania and the Gambia in Africa we try to get into houses to examine these houses and understand the building physics and the, the way people are using the houses. These, like in this, in, in the Gambia, these incredibly uh, hot houses with thick walls and very uh, uh, quite uncomfortable actually uh, to be inside. It might be forty degrees hot inside this uh, poorly ventilated house, uh, and, and and we thought it was important to know this in order to uh, make sure that people could actually use these bed nets. And we compared it uh, for Africa, these different countries, and we compared it to houses in Thailand and the Philippines. 
Uh, we found, for instance, in, in Thailand, these houses, which is in a very similar climate, completely different. It's in a completely different architecture. They're raised on stilts. They have these walls, which are completely open, allowing air to flow all over the place. So these houses are much more comfortable to be in. Uh, and we wanted to understand why, uh, why, why are there these different solutions uh, uh, in different parts of the world? We could see that we, when we looked at temperature, that the houses were very different in temperature inside. So Thailand is relatively cool. Gambia is very hot, but it's the same climate outdoor more or less. So it was the interior of the houses that made the difference. And especially we were looking at temperatures at night because we knew that at nine o'clock when people went to bed, it would be, it would be uh, crucial that it, the houses were cool so they would use the bed net. And we could see again that there was a huge difference from 26 degrees in Thailand to 33 degrees in the Gambia. We started to experiment with houses, trying to, to change them and see if we could uh, do something. We started to do uh, digital modeling, uh, computer simulations, and we could see that we could make a lot of difference by, by changing the geometry of the building and the materials. And we came up with this scale of different uh, models, kind of predicting the, the indoor comfort uh, related to geometry of the building and materials of the building. And we could see that the more uh, Asian the houses became, the more the comfortable they were inside in terms of uh, climate in our digital models. Then we went to Tanzania and we started to build prototypes. We got a project where we built first six experimental houses in, in Tanzania. We wanted to look uh, not only on, uh, at malaria, but actually all, also other health effects like indoor smoke, uh, how to store food, uh, how to, to, uh, to make a safe uh, hygiene spaces, uh, uh, water supply, and we, it, it came up in this uh, uh, model where we raised the bedrooms and made them kind of Asian, uh, raised in light materials. We had a storeroom, we had a cooking area, we had a collected uh, water from the roofs, and we had a good latrine. This was the kind of digital model of these houses. And then we started, we had a lottery. So because we didn't want to just hand out houses in a village. So we, we made this lottery. Uh, and then uh, we started to build, this is a house built in bamboo, which is normally not used in Tanzania, but we found bamboo and started to use it. We also made the same houses in two story versions. Um, this is from the inside of one of the bamboo houses. Um, we also made some houses in wood. You can see here at night how the, the planks are kind of spaced. So we have air moving into the building through the, uh, the planks. And, uh, and, and um, the most radical house we made was this one made in shade net, which is this kind of a, a fabric you use around building sites. And uh, it, it's a very cheap uh, polyethylene netting and you can get it in different uh, 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 densities. So it's more or less open, but it has a very low thermal impact and it allows air to move through the walls. This is from the inside of such a house. And uh, we made them in two stories, also these houses. This was, a, of course, radical here. We put a lot of light inside the house, which is normally not what you do, but, but this is what we do. And then we compare them to traditional houses made from bricks in these villages. And we also try to modify some houses to see if we can improve the existing houses. We built better latrines, uh, kind of also combining our efforts with other scientists uh, doing new latrines. Uh, we improved the water supply by harvesting water from the roofs. And we improved the cooking area so it was an outdoor stove and kind of semi uh, semi uh, uh, outdoor uh, area protected from smoke and then we had the results we could see that in our houses especially if in the two-story uh, houses there was between 19 and 100 percent reduction in mosquitoes compared to the reference houses which is the yellow ones and this single-story houses were also doing very well uh, so it was a huge success in, 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 in terms of reducing uh, the number of mosquitoes. And you could say even the bamboo house and the timber house were not screened. There was no mosquito screen. It was just the geometry of the building kind of reducing the number of, of mosquitoes. Uh, we could also see that they were much more comfortable than new houses. So if you have uh, 80 or 90, 100 is perfect. We had the new house were 80 to 80, 70 time, uh, 70 percent of the time they were comfortable compared to low numbers for the modified houses or the reference houses. And we could also see that we could actually build these new houses more or less to the same price as a traditional house. So a traditional house would be between four and five thousand uh, dollars in this and we would build from four to six thousand dollars. And we could see it was quite expensive to modify houses and they actually they were uh, one of the findings here was that it's better to build a proper new house than to um, try to modify existing houses that's very difficult. 
And we could also, we could see that we could get the price even further down if we could get into a kind of more industrialized uh, way of building houses. And on top of it, we had a few more experiments. We built a, a bamboo house. Uh, we flew in its carpenters from Thailand and uh, we kind of uh, made a second version also. We tried to combine it all, made this big communal space and on the ground floor, which was a cooking area also and, and a place where people could sit. And we could see when we came back after a few years and it actually worked. People have used it a lot, but everything is intact and it's uh, used as this social space where you're protected from mosquitoes sitting there in the evenings. This was uh, the effort of a lot of people from different institutions in Africa and Europe and Asia. Uh, and uh, it was published uh, and we also took it to, uh, <clears throat> to the Venice Biennale and we made a documentary and we tried to get it out both for architects and doctors and uh, a lot of other people. Um, <clears throat> And we started to, to try to understand more about this. And we looked at, the, at the, how housing is changing in Africa. And we could see that, that there's a lot of things happening with uh, metal roofs. Uh, and we could see that this is actually, it might be good in the way that metal roofs will also contribute to the decline of malaria, probably because the metal roofs get hot and it kind of kills the mosquito. And we can see how the, the urban fabric is changing in Africa. We have all these new houses coming up, all these new roofs, and it might actually contribute very, uh, very good to, to help. One thing we knew, wanted to know was uh, how, uh, which is the perfect height. So we had another experiment where we built houses next to each other and kind of lifted them. And we could see that the higher we lifted the houses, the less mosquitoes you got into the house. So it, there was actually a, a very good point in, in uh, raising the house as you do in Africa, in Asia, because it reduces uh, uh, the number of mosquitoes into the house uh, dramatically. 90% of them get away by just uh, raising the house. Now, the next project is the Star Homes. And, it, and we kind of uh, thought, let's look at not only a malaria now, but let's get it right and make a, a project where we look at malaria, respiratory tract infections, and diarrheal diseases. And we try to combine all the knowledge we had and looking at different building components, uh, a ground floor, a storage, bed nets, water harvesting system, kind of all this into one system. And we actually use the sustainable goals as a kind of a framework to kind of uh, address all the different uh, uh, um, components of a building and, and relate them to different health issues to kind of test whether it would work or whether it wouldn't work. And we built had a test site uh, where we started to build a new generation of houses first we built uh, uh, houses in wood which was nice but it was actually also very difficult to get the quality right we are now uh, in a very rural area of south tanzania we found a local building system in uh, steel where the, you produce directly from our uh, digital drawings you put them in uh, you have a roll of steel you roll it and you cut it to size so there's zero waste and we started to, to test these building systems where you see there's a, a, a kind of a concrete wall. It's not concrete, it's actually only a, a very thin uh, plaster, which is stabilizing the house. Uh, and uh, we, again, we use this shape net for, for walls. We tested different floor types and, and uh, made uh, several generations of these test houses. And this is what we came up with. Uh, this is a simple house uh, where we have two bedrooms on, on the top floor and we have a storeroom and a kitchen on the ground floor. This is uh, again from the test side. <clears throat> um, this is a drawing of it all. On the ground floor, we have the kitchen, which has been hugely simplified from the first version uh, in, uh, in the previous study. And we have the bedrooms upstairs and the solar power. And uh, this is the kitchen where we have this uh, small stove which is uh, reducing fuel consumption uh, by two thirds. Uh, we have all these different components where we try to get it right, like fire safety. We try to make very accessible staircases. We try to make uh, fences so you can't fall down. We have a, a flush system for the water collection. So, so it's only the clean water we take from the roof. We kind of uh, have a first flush going off. We have a fly-proof uh, latrine uh, screening of the uh, windows and doors. And we try to kind of get it really right. This is from the first floor, different uh, types of shape net. This is the staircase without the railing. Uh, we try to make very good details around windows and doors and make them very strong, these uh, uh, components. Uh, we work with local materials like uh, these uh, printed uh, kankas, these, uh, so, so you can use them for, for shading and uh, privacy of uh, the windows. Uh, and this is uh, at night time how it looks. This is from the inside where you have a bed net and a, and a child in a bed. 
uh, we can see when we look at it now, it seems like we are, we are having 30 to 40 less embodied carbon, less uh, energy and 70% uh, less concrete than a comparable house in a village. So we are using a lot of, uh, a lot less materials and actually the steel can be reused if we, if we take the house apart uh, later. Uh, this is from uh, an opening party. And, and then we went out and we examined 14,600 houses in a, in a huge area here. Uh, we went from house to house. We have lots of data on all these houses. We had lottery in each uh, village uh, where we selected one or two houses spots and we compare now. This is one of the women who, uh, who won a, a house. Typically, we are looking for the worst houses and we replace it by a new house uh, and we compare the houses. So these are the 110 houses. We've selected 110 houses because this is what we need statistically to prove a health impact. So we, what we're doing now is the second phase is a huge randomized uh, controlled trial where we, for the first time, are trying to, to show direct impact of a, a house on, uh, on health. Uh, this is uh, the platform built, uh, the, the foundation. This is the structure in the village. This is a kind of, a, it's going up here, the, the walls. This is a finished house without the screen in a village. We are now a couple of months from finishing all the 110 houses up. We are now uh, ready to do uh, the finishing uh, works on all the houses. And after this, we will follow 1,300 children in three years to see what is the impact of these houses. There will be doctors and nurses going out to these houses all the time. We will have biologists going out, checking how many mosquitoes. We'll have all kinds of researchers looking into the data, architects looking for how the houses are performing. The first thing we found was an unexpected one. We had all these data from 13,000 houses and we could see, we were wondering why is that so, uh, why we had difficult finding enough houses with uh, children. Uh, there was many houses with old people living in the, in, the, in the worst houses. And we could see from the data that there's a, uh, there's a huge uh, uh, decrease in wealth by age, which was unexpected. But this was one of the things we found. So Africa is changing at the moment. It used to be that you would take very good care of your elderly. It is, it's becoming more and more difficult, in, in certain, at least in this area. People are poor and, uh, and they, uh, it, it's difficult. So this is kind of the, the team, uh, uh, medical doctors, entomologists, architects, uh, uh, researchers of all kinds uh, from all over the world working uh, together. And uh, again, it's a, uh, we architects are using a third of the uh, resources. And it's especially important to look at, uh, at Africa because world population is growing very uh, a lot. So, so we know that we need houses for 2 billion people in Africa uh, in the next 30 years. Uh, there's a uh, 1.3 billion new uh, residents and then we have to rebuild a lot of the houses. So we should be really concerned about houses. This is a major thing in, when we talk about sustainability on a, on a kind of a global scale. This is for me one of the big issues. I mean, it's not only housing, it's also roads and schools and airports. But this is really where we should focus a lot of energy. And it's also possible, I think, this is how Africa looked 100 years ago. And in, in many ways, it looks like this today, but also there was these houses before, which has been kind of forgotten. These are houses from Angola a hundred years ago, built and still, but you don't find them anymore. And we could see in the villages where we have been building examples, suddenly people start to imitate, not the house directly, but the principles, large windows, uh, kind of openings in the, in the, so people are really looking for good examples also. That's kind of what you hope for. And of course, also houses have to be uh, they have to look good, they have to be aesthetically pleasing, because it's also uh, about identity, and it's like that for, for all of us all over the world, no matter where you come from. And then last, uh, Africa is huge, I mean, it's this, uh, uh, the area of China, United States, India, and Europe combined, so there will be many different solutions. This is not one solution that fits everybody, but this is kind of uh, one of the solutions. Thank you. I hope I didn't went too much over time. <laughs> But it was fine. Thank you very much, Jakob. It's very interesting. And I think it's fantastic to see this combination of scientific research and architecture. Thanks. And we look, for, we look forward to seeing the results of this uh, uh, possibility, actually, of making true proof, uh, which is definitely needed. But thank you very much. We'll hurry on to the next speaker. Our next presenter is uh, Mr. Kelly Doran, Senior Principal in Mars Design Group, and uh, you will present the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture in Rwanda. 
and uh, yeah, you already you already there, so that's fine. The word is yours. Great, you can see my screen. Yes. Excellent, thank you, and uh, honor honor to join you all. Um, so I'm going to speak uh, to Rika specifically and introduce um, just to introduce Mass. Uh, we are about 11 years old now. We started in Rwanda, and Mass stands for a model of architecture serving society. We are a team of over 120 architects, engineers, writers, filmmakers, and researchers uh, representing 20 countries across the globe. And our mission is to build, research, and advocate for architecture that promotes uh, justice and human dignity. Um, I've been uh, you know, honored to work with uh, RICA, the Rwanda Institute of Conservation and Agriculture now for about four years. Um, this past year, They've admitted the first class and we're currently building and, and hoping to open the second for the second uh, class of students uh, this fall. Uh, when we started out this project, we looked at the SDGs. In fact, in, in our original uh, meetings with our, with our partner, we said, okay, how many of these can we cover in this project? And I think that it was pretty clear right away, the program of the institution, albeit education, was focused on hunger and agriculture as a means to address peace and stability and take lift people out of poverty. And around that, I think we're also beginning to look at the architecture and its role in sustainable cities, consumption, climate, and life on land. And the one that I think is probably the most important of all of these is partnerships. And we've been really fortunate to be working with the Howard G. Buffett Foundation from the beginning, who's had the, you know, had the vision for this, uh, this project, for this institution, and has funded it uh, in its entirety. We began to look at, uh, you know, the project in the kind of greater light about what is the current development of agriculture in Rwanda and on the continent. And what you've seen in Rwanda as a kind of standard for much of the developing world and frankly much of the world before it is a kind of as, as development's been happening and population growth has been happening over the past few decades, along with it has been agricultural development at, at the expense of things like tree cover and habitat and biodiversity. And what this has really looked at is where you're moving from healthy ecosystems to poorly functioning ecosystems and, and monocultural forms of agriculture, erosion, uh, all the things that we're kind of familiar with, the problems that happen with uh, rapid development. And I think that we began out, we began this project around looking at uh, concepts of one health, about how to tie human, animal, and ecological systems together. And what's been really interesting clearly with COVID is it's exposed how important a concept this is that our health is inextricably linked. Um, to move from mono, monocultures towards uh, conservation agriculture, which is looking at how various species can coexist and actually increase yields and reduce uh, the need for things like pesticides and fertilizer um, on, a, on a project. And in the process, a kind of instead of nature being against agriculture, them actually working together, that, that yield yields productivity both, uh, both in like what we're going to eat, what's coming off the, uh, off the land, but also in biological diversity. Um, and when we began this kind of beginning to look at the master plan for this campus, it's a ground up campus uh, for three years of students of roughly 280 students total, including all their housing, was how can we stitch in the architecture and the landscape into this one health idea? So from the beginning, Students in their first year live in first year farms. They, they, they work in groups of 21 to begin to understand what it means to be a small uh, landholder farmer. And in the middle of it is this house that they all uh, live within and the barn that, where they keep their animals. Um, this housing, including the faculty housing, is laid into um, the area between, we, we inherited a contact uh, savanna woodland, uh, and on the other end, a papyrus wetland. And so we wanted to kind of um, tie in all the conservation measures through uh, through this part of the site. On the other part of the site is uh, agricultural learning and these enterprises where they learn raw to process to, uh, means of of taking taking a crop. In this case, this is the fruit and veg uh, enterprise, and, and adding value to it um, uh, over the process of the building. And again, looking at how the site and the section of the site can really the architecture becomes a reading of the agricultural process. This is a view of a kind of concept of it a couple of years ago, where you begin to see the campus center at the middle of the campus where they have a large dining facility, really farm to table here, obviously, and the enterprises that stitch within the landscape beyond. And you know what you've talked about and, and uh, Jakob just talked about, I think how the big, 
the big goal, frankly, from a climate perspective, and one that we've been talking about uh, from this project from the beginning was, how are we addressing climate change and what is the role of architecture? And really, this, this challenge we have this decade and the nine years, the 9.2 years we have left here to tackle it, how do we have the current emissions um, to, to meet the, the first target? And half of what? So I think architects, uh, certainly, and engineers have not really understood that we have a disproportionate uh, impact from a client perspective. Forty percent of emissions are related to buildings. It's a big responsibility. Eleven percent of that in new construction. So from we looking at the operational side, this campus is 100 percent off grid. Uh, it's powered by this large solar array, which you can see here. We're cycling water from the lake, cleaning it on site. Recycling waste from animals and using it as fertilizer. We're trying to be as kind of um, uh, light touch on the land as possible. Uh, from an embodied carbon perspective at Mass, we've been looking across our projects to figure out how are we getting below this target? How are we halving? So, across our suite of projects, tracking this and think what's working well, how do we use it again, how do we improve upon it? At UGHE, a project we completed a couple of years ago, we're nine tenths. So this is very conventional construction. At Bataro, a project 10 years ago we completed, we're half, we're roughly 20 years ahead of its time from a climate perspective. And in reflecting on this, we really looked at this project as the carbon footprint has a, has a direct relationship to the human handprint. These things have to be seen together. That socioeconomic development and socioeconomic justice is climate justice. And the word of our master Mason and Marie here, that no amount of value can be assigned to dignity, I can relate directly to the ideas of Morris, where we're beginning to look at the project of construction as a social project again. Eureka, we're at 40%. We're two-fifths of the, of the global average, and we've been hard working hard to, to get to that number. Uh, we've been doing it by using materials and going back, frankly, in time to some of the photos that Jakob just showed of, like, what did people build with here, right? What was the, the initial constructions? So, um, you know, we're used to ceramic tiles, which should historically been used on the roofing um, that are fired with coffee husk. We are used wood frame. We're trying to promote timber construction. In fact, most of it's sourced from Tanzania uh, uh, instead of steel, which you know, as you've seen is, is the predominant construction method for roofing. We, we're using earth-based walling that limits cement and steel, rammed earth and earth blocks here. From a thermal mass perspective, Rwanda isn't as hot as, as Tanzania. You want to hold on to that heat at night to keep people warm at night. And lastly, we stone foundations. This turned out to be the most radical thing we could do from a climate perspective. And it really made me think about why we are so wedded to concrete, certainly for our foundations. Um, to do this, we have you know, blessed with this incredible team of engineers that went out and dug holes on the site. We have a 1300 hectare site. We found the best clay, the best uh, sand on site to be doing, making the walls from it. We're literally harvesting the architecture from the site. We went out and, and, and visited mills around the region, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, to find people that could uh, you know, supply the project with sustainably uh, sourced woods. Um, and we don't have EPDs in Rwanda. We don't have an environmental product declaration to help us calculate what our footprint is. And we actually work in countries, by and large, that do not have this database handy. So we worked with our suppliers, these are the folks that do the ceramic tiles, to develop the first EPD in Rwanda and understand from quarry to kiln what the process is in their manufacturing. We kind of cribbed our notes and we built up our own document database here to go through everything we're doing and finding ways to improve it and tuning it and, and really pushing down the embodied carbon. And I think this is kind of where we've seen the results. This on the left, a kind of business as usual project uh, on the left using a lot of steel and, and concrete ring beams and ours on the right, 40% uh, difference and again, radical reductions in, in wood framing and stone foundations. 96% of Rika's materials uh, are excavated sourced in country. Rwanda is a small country, it's the size of the Netherlands. Um, you know, we, we did our best to keep the weight close to home. You, you wanna keep, you wanna make the mass of this project not come from far away. So as mentioned, a lot of the soil sands came from the site itself at a mile away, 10 miles out, some of the, the more aggregate for the project came in. At 100 miles, the scale of the whole uh, country. This is where most of our most of the weight's coming from: uh, timber, cement, terracotta, ceramics. At a more regional scale, we have to reach out to places like Dar and Nairobi to get the wiring and the kind of more specialty fixtures, electrical, etc., plumbing. And then finally, at the scale of the globe, it's the specialty stuff: the solar plant and the batteries. 
98% of the labor of this project is a source within a mile, 100 miles of the project as well. Um, we worked with our contractor to find every able body in the district to work on this project. We fired over a thousand people over the course of its construction. Um, we've also reached out to uh, find artisans across the country to help us figure out, we wanna like make tile in Rwanda. Uh, Hiro Alaris, who's the kind of godfather of ceramics, making these handmade tiles for the walls. Uh, working with cooperatives that weave things like uh, sisal for uh, light fixtures. Um, working with the, the, the steel manufacturers in Kigali to make the dressers and these kind of custom uh, fittings. We started our own workshop to meet the demands of building all the desks and furniture for this campus, completely designed by our team and, and manufactured in country instead of importing it. And then finally, we worked with banana weavers, agricultural byproducts as a way to like bring it into the, to the, the feel of this place, make it a truly agricultural project. So you can see here, banana fibers, couch backs. And finally, look, okay, great. You've done all this work. You've got a really low embodied carbon. I think the real question is then how do we actually make architecture positive? How can it actually claim to be net zero or go beyond? And we're blessed. We're blessed with this big site. So, you know, through the landscape and how we manage landscape, uh, buildings need to begin to have relationships with their region once again. And through it, um, we have developed a plan with our partner to plant. You know, we, we've got all this room. We've been planting trees on this area that was formerly deforested. And so we've been working with Atelier 10 to figure out, okay, what rate of sequestration, how many trees should we plant, what species to get there. And we figured that this, this red bar charts is our body footprint of the housing, the buildings, the landscape, and the infrastructure. Um, we figured that this decade through planting only 20 hectares, can we actually entirely offset this project? Because again, we're starting from such a lower place. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Very interesting and also a good example of how difficult it is actually to place some of these projects into just one, under just one goals, the heading of one goal. That's really difficult because most of them are into many different goals. Thank you very much, very interesting. Um, and we will now move on to the debate on the role of architecture um, in achieving these sustainable development goals and the overarching principle of leaving no one behind. We have invited three guests from very different parts of the world. And I hope you are ready. Um, so we've invited Bishak Sayir Titas from Bangladesh. He is the co-chair of the UIA SDG Commission together with Natalie Musin. He is also the member of the UIA Region 4. He's an architect. Architect Director of Viti Shep. I can't pronounce it honestly. Shapati Brindo Limited, something like that. I'm sorry. And then we have invited Isauro Torres from Chile. We are very pleased that you're here also. You are the ambassador of Chile in Denmark. And we all know that Chile has very special and dedicated focus on the sustainable development and in particular the compliance with the Urban Agenda 2030. And finally, Ramato Aliyu from Nigeria, your PhD, an architect, principal at Plan Sheltered Consult, and also member of the UIA SGD Commission. So we are very pleased that three of you are here, and please unmute, and then I will give the word to Natalia, who will be the moderator of this debate. Thank you very much, Annette. At the so inspired by the two uh, presentations, thank you so much. And I, I see there's also questions and comments digging in. But then I will focus on the panel and then hopefully we will somehow magically make enough time to also take some of the, the, the good questions coming in, in the chat and the Q&A. But uh, allow me uh, to start by asking you, uh, Ischiak, why, uh, why do you think it's, uh, that the uh, architect and architecture's contribution to the SDGs matters so much? Uh, thank you, Natalie. Uh, I thank the Danish Academy and also UIA to arrange this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, it's been a wonderful work uh, the team has done and uh, published this book. And this is the second one in line. And uh, it's a tedious job, but uh, thanks that uh, we all together could make it 
very fast. And this book actually, I have this book number one with me in my hand, but actually uh, this depicts why architect, what is the importance, why architects do need this, all these things. And today, just now, after these two presentations by Yakob and uh, Kelly, I think it is all clear how far architects can reach out and all these 17 SDG goals. Uh, you know that uh, UN, UN Habitat and United Nations been talking about that 17 SDG goal will be won or lost in cities. So whatever uh, uh, all these goals, the face will be cities. Whether we see the hunger, it is achieved or not, it will be seen in the cities through the architecture, through the uh, space in between the building, the urban spaces, what we create. So we architects, as, as architects and urban planner and all other urban professional of this built environment has a very important role to play actually in the process of making a better city in future. And it all has to be by plan making at all level. All level means, I know this, we've been talking about all these projects, reducing inequalities and public health and everything. And it has to be, as we have, uh, Kelly has shown in his project, also uh, Yakov has shown that we have to bring all the actors together in the building process. So cities are the result of the interaction between human being and their built environment. So architect through design, create spaces. These are interaction bit by bit, by designing building and also the space in between the building, this is very, very important. We create the urban spaces. So uh, I'll go by some points. Uh, I will take uh, two or three points, like how we can do this, how, how we can, how uh, our, our work gets impacts. I, I consider that that also been uh, 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 last two projects, we have seen that, that to safeguard and promote the traditional tested knowledge. This is very, very important. The arts that has been shaping our urban areas of our time. In the process of designing it, recognize the collaboration process of building and physical culture and social identities that define the place. Place making is very, very important too. And then the process of building, the second is The process of building, through this process of building, we actually consume energy and natural resources. So we have to find ourselves to be sensible and so that it does not produce much waste. And uh, uh, in return or in the process, it should not aggravate the inequalities and that should not affect our health. And then comes the land development. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very integral part of our development. And every year we lose agricultural land, we lose wetlands and in the name of development, by all the professionals, but we have to be very, very careful because it will generate poverty and result into sparring of informal settlement in urban areas. And lastly, the quality planning and design, I think is the most important thing, not only design. I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to ensure the quality and a quality design can catalyze urban regeneration, create socially and culturally inclusive space and promote greening of cities. It also recognized that inequality can be combated by good design. So I think uh, SDG gives us direction to resolve uh, the 17 goals, all these issues. And therefore we as an architect and from our SDG commission, we recognize these 17 goals. And uh, as this publication, whoever goes through this one can easily understand that how architects can contribute in this uh, 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 they are important and how we can contribute into this 17 goal. And we pledge that also the carbon neutrality should be our uh, into our architects community in the in the process of what we design. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Isaro Soros, moving on to you, uh, speaking about the uh, built environment in your uh, local context, uh, which measures uh, have priority uh, which are you focused on when you look at the interaction of the built environment and the, and the goals? Well, 
first of all, many thanks for um, inviting me to participate in the webinar. From, from the outset, let me uh, just stress that I'm not an architect and I do have a general interest in architecture as many other people do. Uh, the first thing I would very much like to congratulate you on, the, uh, on your book, the, uh, An Architectural Guide for the UN 17 SDEs. I think it's a, it's a great contribution. It shows us very explicitly uh, through this great uh, collection of architectural projects throughout the world, uh, how architects and architecture uh, can contribute to, to each one of the SDGs. I, I particularly like the, uh, the uh, smaller scale interventions on a grassroots level that are illustrated in the book. And I, and I have the feeling that, uh, that uh, when this same, same grassroots needs and demands are here uh, beforehand and then picked up by architecture or architects, then you reach like a virtuous circle. And clearly we saw it vividly in the previous presentations uh, focused in, in Africa. Uh, let me just say that um, Alejandro Aravena, it's, it's the only Chilean architect that has won um, a Prisker Prize, perhaps uh, for his contribution to social housing in, uh, in Chile through its so-called uh, half houses. He highlights the, the, the need for, for architects and, and urban planners to, to truly engage with other fields, uh, as we have seen uh, very vividly in the presentations, economic field, social field, the environment, and speak the language uh, before translating them into formal design proposals. And, and if we are take, talking about uh, people's voices, uh, I think, very humble, that, that architects, they need to give form uh, to the places where people live, uh, because such, such format or such form can ruin or, or can improve uh, people's quality of life for, for a long period of time, if not for a lifetime. And, and then, uh, since we're talking about cities, and I acknowledge that uh, perhaps uh, by, I understand that by 2050, we'll have about 2.5 billion people living in, in cities in this so-called uh, ur urban age. Uh, architects and architecture uh, uh, should rather be listening and, and speaking a, a broader language that indeed today is, it's very well represented by the Agenda 2030 and uh, and, and set by, 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 uh, by the UN and, and specifically about SDG 11 that deals with, um, with uh, uh, sustainable cities. So, so the act of designing buildings uh, in line with the SDGs, I think that at least ensures the creation of uh, healthier, healthier places and therefore healthier people, communities and, and, and societies. Uh, perhaps I can expand on the next questions on the issue of how my country is dealing with, with the matter. Thank you very much, Natalie. So, uh, moving on to you, Roman. So, um, in your opinion, how can uh, architecture, landscape architecture, and planning contribute uh, to the challenges we are facing? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Natalie. I'm, I'm very much honored to be here. And uh, yes, indeed, architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, all uh, transform spaces. They, trans they have the power to transform lives positively if well handled and negatively if not well handled. If it is not well handled, there is a shortage of knowledge. And we have a body of knowledge out there which most times, architects don't go out to seek. We designers want to create fantastic buildings without reference to the impact they have on environment and on the users. But when studying architecture, there is what is called the false principle. When you have a brief, you have to go into research. You go into research, find the best materials you can use, get the best ideas, and like the world is in a dynamic form now. Every now and then you have uh, a lot of innovation, a lot of research. And that brings me to uh, the presentation by uh, Jacob. Very, very inspiring. You can see that when you have uh, a community, uh, sustainable community design approach to any space, you tend to have uh, uh, maximum impact 
or use of the 70 SDGs. It is possible to have uh, all the SDG in, especially in a community design. Community design uh, spans from micro to macro. While designing a unit, you have to have a broader uh, uh, imagine, imagination of your immediate environment and what you think that environment should be in the, in the uh, near future. With design, you can influence health, quality health, both with landscape, with architectural design, with urban planning, with architecture, you can influence, uh, uh, have impact health when you know the, 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 the when you understand the flow of, uh, of air, air flow, uh, ventilation, uh, when you take nature into cognizance, basically, when it is where it is possible. Then also, like the goals are interrelated, you can have, have a knowledge of how to source for uh, good quality water to your project and how to dispose of uh, uh, either construction, uh, uh, construction waste or uh, wastewater and, uh, and the solid uh, waste in your ho houses. You have to have knowledge of all this. Architecture, if well uh, articulated, can actually take advantage of this knowledge and create a better environment for the present generation while taking into cognizance that there will be another generation after us. This is what the sustainable principle uh, is all about. And that is what the SDG is anchored on. So to have a maximum impact, in my own opinion, is to have the sustainable development goal design, the sustainable community uh, development uh, approach to every design you have, you, you, you approach to every design uh, you face. And with that, you find out that the health of the, of the community will be better or the user of the project. You find out that the social uh, integration of the community will be better. And as well as the environmental uh, factors also. So you find out that landscape, whether within a, a unit building, the use of uh, selected uh, plant, when you have a good knowledge of it, to the use of uh, landscape elements and monuments in cities, like you want to have a direction in a city, you have uh, maybe a monument that gives you direction that is impacting on your social being. Like you have the Tower of Hill in uh, Paris, you have the Marble Arch in London, and you have the Times Square in, uh, in, 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 in New York. So these are elements in urban landscape that can help the social being of the people. So in essence, in my opinion, I believe uh, when you have the principle, when you have uh, the principle of uh, uh, sustainable community design behind your thinking of design, either micro design or macro, you find out that you will have, uh, you will solve a lot of problem, human problem, and in fact, uh, creating a sustainable environment, uh, both socially and environmentally. That is my submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there was a good uh, question asked earlier in the Q and A uh, below. Uh, Miriam is asking. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, also in response to what you saw on my side. That uh, with a focus on all the challenges of all the harm that we need to make less of, less uh, damage to the environment, uh, less. Uh, uh, social, uh, negative social impact and so on. And she's asking, well, um, has the sphere potential to also be support regeneration rather than just reduce sort of a project about reducing harm? And I think certainly for me, uh, and I'd like to ask you also, you panelists in your local context, um, I would say that the SDGs, uh, they are a policy of regeneration, of uh, reaching for something more than just uh, uh, than just reducing harm, uh, but it's obvious that 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 uh, that we when we build in real context, we we build in situations where there is um, harm being done. So so it's a double movement. It's both about say, for instance, uh, building on a on a site that's been flooded so that it can so that the school can be used when the flood comes. That's that's like uh, living with climate change. But also, of course, building in materials that doesn't add to the uh, uh, to the destabilization of, of climate. 
uh, hopefully then the school will be beautiful, will be a place for, for learning. Uh, so, so we are not just talking about uh, reacting to crisis, but also contributing to life and regenerating life. But I would like to ask, and maybe moving back to you, is someone you said you would like to address maybe some local examples from the from Chile about um, about the strategies and priorities. The um, well, since we are we are we are discussing nowadays with the issue of the um, of the pandemic. Um, and then when talking about the SDGs and the challenges, the SDGs, um, let me just say that indeed, at least in my country, uh, uh, the pandemic does represent a um, uh, worrying setback uh, for most SDGs. And, um, and indeed, all this deep economic and, and um, social crisis uh, res resulting from the measures to prevent the spread of the of the pandemic uh, is hitting hard. At least the efforts of, of, of my country to advance the UN Agenda 2030. Um, until last year, progress in achieving the goals made it possible uh, to be moderately compliant. Uh, uh, although the horizon of a decade um, to achieve them was not feasible, according to our experts. Now, with the pandemic. Uh, it has produced like a critical situation that, according to various analysis, um, is causing a notable reversal uh, in most of the indicators, both in Chile and I would say perhaps in many other uh, developing uh, countries. Uh, the, the issue is that paradoxically, uh, and, um, and when you analyze the impact of the pandemic on SDG number 11, that this with cities, uh, it has been, for what I'm, I'm looking into some statistics, it has been relatively neutral because congestions in the cities and air pollution has been one of the, uh, like the positive externalities generated by the pandemic, uh, since the economic slowdown and population confinement measures uh, reduce congestions in, in most, uh, at least in most of Latin American cities. Uh, which in turn improve their quality and uh, and uh, and 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 has put forward the needs of perhaps in, in increasing the, the the need to generate more bicycle lanes in the future or uh, more green areas or, or less overcrowding uh, in housing, which has been accentuated by the pandemic, and that will generate obviously new incentives for our architects and urban planners. I, I would very much like to stop shortly in the, in the issue of uh, urban inequality that does affect us in Chile very much as in the rest of the uh, developing world. Indeed, for us, it's a great problem and challenge uh, that we have at this time. I think that poor or unreasonable urban planning, more than a solution, has become uh, the cause of the problems of urban inequality in our cities. And, and, and quoting um, uh, once more uh, uh, Aravena, architect Aravena, I think that he correctly points out that the problem of social housing in Chile and in other countries, it is not how many square meters it has, uh, but where they are. And, and location in our cities, uh, it, in, it becomes crucial in terms of quality of, of, of life associated to better public spaces, green areas, or nearby public transportation. So in a way, seg segregation levels could decrease if urban infrastructure reaches the suburbs. And let me just finally stop in an issue that it's very much related to my country. Uh, last Sunday, we, we Chileans, we voted overwhelmingly in favor of changing our constitution. And then uh, this work will begin next year. We will have to elect members that will draft uh, the, the constitution. And the debate has already started and their opinions in favor or, or against, including in the constitutional debate as how our cities uh, should be. And, and I fully endorse the, in a way, the opinion that the city as a concept should be, uh, should be discussed. Uh, universal access to a room, to a roof, uh, sounds reasonable to be enshrined in the constitution. And I understand that uh, there are European constitutions that include the right to, to housing. So at least for us, we are excited, but because it can be an excellent opportunity for our society to talk about, uh, about this issue at the level of a constitutional discussion, because at least our cities in Chile, they badly need a change. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, I'll give the word to you, Nick, uh, and we are we are we are moving to the final comments from the uh, first few weeks, and then Romatu before Amede uh, uh, gets to work finally. Please, Jack. Thank you, uh, Natalie. I I could not hear your first part of the uh, question, but uh, I was uh, disconnected by I understand from uh, Isoros uh, Torres uh, discussion. So uh, uh, the main slogan for uh, SDG is uh, leave no one behind. So since 2015, we've been talking about this leave no one behind, but on 20 20 in, 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 in Abu Dhabi, we included no place also behind. So no one behind and no place behind. So it all relates with how, how can you make it happen not to leave anyone behind? You have to bring the equality into, in, your, in your project, in your society, in your cities. And this is the way we can do it. And as far as I'm, I come from Bangladesh and my city is Dhaka, one of the uh, uh, one of the most challenging city in the world. And, uh, and uh, uh, climate change and inequality, I think this is the two more challenging issues we need to deal with. And we have this urban flooding and also we have this national flooding from the climate perspective. But our government is uh, at the moment uh, dealing with uh, this, like how to live with flooding, how to live with the disaster. These are a lot of, uh, uh, good uh, examples coming up, how the success stories to deal with this. And also government is dealing with uh, goal number one and two. I think these are two issues there being hunger and poverty is being, we'll have a, uh, something in hand after in 2030, I, I, I guess. But we have to focus on the inequality issue that I, I consider is most. So, I mean, uh, to me, I, I believe the equality Equity should be the main approach uh, to major sustainability in, in terms of uh, uh, developing cities and, and conceptualizing the designing the built environment and achieving equity through design. And that will lead to the built environment. And also like uh, 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 land infrastructure, the basic services, this has to be and uh, planned, uh, keeping uh, uh, low income people in, in, in our mind. Also the public uh, services that should be planned together with community they serve through, uh, through uh, a participatory process. It, there has to be engaged, the local people has to be engaged. And this is how we can engage the women, children, older people, the persons with disability. And uh, as in these books, we have uh, three projects from Bangladesh. Uh, they also portray this, how the engagement of the people has been uh, shown in this project to the local people participation and the architects and the designer. And thus the small bits by bits we will, we will build up our cities and make it more resilient also. So uh, uh, then again, it comes to the, uh, uh, to me is I believe that the providing quality uh, design solution in the building and also in the public spaces. This is very, very important for us. Uh, urban areas, parks, we can eliminate all the physical and spatial forms of segregation and exclusion. Thus we can reduce the inequality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Romato, you get, the you get the last word in the panel debate. And I, I'm just seeing a, a good uh, question in the chat uh, on asking us for advice on how architects can engage uh, with these challenges. I know it's a difficult question, but uh, do you have good advice? No, it's quite easy a question because uh, architects are always faced with challenges. Every design of an architect is trying to solve a challenge, to solve a problem. So in trying to solve this problem, I think the architect should be a body, have a, uh, be a body of knowledge and should be able to have synergy with all the players in the built environment. Not until we architect accept that, won't be able to solve problems effectively on a sustainable basis. So the architect has to work with all players, including lawmakers. In the lawmakers make laws that allows for 
buildings to exist, environment to exist. So sometimes the law, the architect will have to take up the issue of advocacy. You have to advocate for this guide, this uh, uh, guide for uh, 17 uh, years, uh, architect's guide to sustainable uh, design. So, so uh, the architect will have to uh, take up the issue of advocacy and uh, understand what uh, what is happening in its environment and uh, uh, be sure that every line drawn has a, a reason. Every material used is well analyzed on the impact at a micro, macro level and at a macro level. And every, every uh, disposal pro uh, process of uh, waste, uh, building waste, we have to be properly articulated. And in the end, you have to understand the principle of sustainability. Not until this is done, architects will not be able to design the environment that is sustainable, socially or environmentally. Our health depends on this. Our future depend, depends on, on, on this. So we have to take, uh, uh, embrace a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, the materials they out there already. Architects, some architects are already going into research. Some are giving feedback from the challenges they have with their design and on the site. And I believe if there is a synergy between the lawmakers, and the, and the players in the built environment, if you have a, uh, a bank of idea for reference for future generation, this is my submission. Thank you. Thank you so much for these beautiful words and thank you uh, to all three of you from the panel and over to you, Annette. Yeah, I would like to say thank you again also to all of you especially, of course, the speakers and presenters here, but also to all the people who actually tuned in here. I've, I've noted that we've been about 120 persons at, at some point, and that, I think that's quite impressive. Um, so maybe it, it could encourage us to make some more of these panel discussions and to get wiser. Um, but until now, we would like to receive information from you uh, on projects from around the world. Uh, which this guidebook could inspire you to uh, look at. And uh, we would very much like to receive that and uh, to put it into our future work on uh, how, how we can see that architecture can make a contribution to make this world a better one. So thank you very much to all of you and have a very good day and a good night to some of you and uh, hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye.